U toku utakmice nekoliko puta i vodstvo gde su stvarno mogli da i ostvare pobedu. Međutim, mi se nijedna tu utakmice nismo se nijednog momenta predavali. Mislim da je to bila jedna izvjetno. After demonstrating the grit to match their flair, the babes were through to the semi-finals for the second successive year. They were going well in the FA Cup. Their form in the league had picked up. All that was left to do was to celebrate victory and make the journey back to Manchester. The vital game against table-topping Wolves waiting for them. Sadly, many of them would never see home again. The morning after celebrating a hard-earned victory in Belgrade, United boarded flight 609, due to arrive back in Manchester at six o'clock that evening. Captain Thane had flown the two legs of the outward journey, so it was agreed that Captain Raymond would operate the return flight, standard practice for two such experienced pilots. I was going into the semi-final of the European Cup for the first time in my life. They were going into it for the second time. When I say they, the club prior to my time, you don't need to explain the euphoria and the feeling of young men some with sore heads and some without. And the same applied to the press. And I'm saying this not in a derogatory way, we had the best of the English press with us. I mean, everybody was was laughing and, and playing cards and, and it was great. And when we came down to, to the airport in, in Munich, it was, it was cold and, and snowing. Weather was bad um, and there was uh, snow on the, on the runway and they didn't have the facilities that they have these days, you know. As the plane descended, Captain Raymond switched on the plane's de-icing equipment. Air was heated to over 70 degrees Celsius and circulated around the wings. The Lord Burley landed at Munich Airport at 17 minutes past one in the afternoon and then switched off its engines for a scheduled refueling. At 2.30 p.m., with the wings still warm and having received clearance for takeoff, the plane began rolling on its first attempt. You could you could hear the engines revving, and and and, and 
getting really loud and then he put his brakes on. A second attempted takeoff was aborted at 2.35. We set off again and we went much, much further and the, the wheels were making a big bow wave, like a bow, a boat in the bow. But the second time, the bow wave was much, much bigger. I, could feel, I felt it, you know. What the hell? Well, we made uh, two attempts before the fatal run and on both of these occasions, we had this boost surging, which was not terribly serious, but it was something that one ought to really do something about. And I abandoned the first takeoff and got permission to turn around on the runway and make another attempt. And this fort uh, came out again. And at that stage, I decided to go back to the tarmac to discuss it with the engineer. The boost surging was a familiar problem in the Elizabethan aircraft. It was more acute at high-altitude airports like Munich, although both pilots agreed theoretically it wouldn't reduce their takeoff power. Fresh snow was now falling on the runway, and Duncan Edwards, for one, thought he would be staying the night in Munich. He sent a telegram to his landlady in Manchester. I, I know that some people thought that there was a possibility of... Uh night stopping or going back by train but it certainly hadn't crossed my mind at the time i don't think anybody was particularly worried if, they, if anybody was worried they, they would have said so tommy taylor happened to be passing by and and, and, and he said to me uh, I, I hope this time they, they will have uh, uh, you know they will look into it properly the plane would then make its third and fatal takeoff attempt the pilots and ground crew once again surveyed the wings and saw no reason for them to be de-iced. At three minutes past three, the plane started rolling. One minute later, it would end in disaster. And it took us out a third time. And then all hell broke loose after that. Strapped in the back seat was Tom Cable. And that's when I thought, hey, he's terrified. Some of the boys got into the plane and they swapped seats, they went at the back. We started off down the runway and I looked across diagonally at Roger, who was not a good flyer. And Roger was a very worried fella and into myself, it's hard to describe unless you're a card. I thought he's more frightened than I am. And I, I, I can remember somebody saying, that we might crash this third time and Bill Whelan, who was a little bit religious, Bill said, well, I'm ready for it. I watched and watched and watched the bow wave of snow and watched out the window and knew we'd gone a lot further than we'd gone the first two times. And we got to that point on the runway, which we know as V1, which I suppose you might say is the point of no return. And at this point, the aircraft ceased to accelerate. And then Captain Raymond called out, Christ, we won't make it. We ran through the, uh, the outer fence and, uh, and then everybody knew that this was, this was not normal. We started skidding and, and uh, I, the light went off in the, in, the, in the plane. We came down, we bounced once, twice, three or four times, we bounced. I thought I'm going to get killed. And that was it. Everything went black. The plane had burst through the airport's perimeter fence, collided with a house just outside the airport, and hit a tree. One hundred meters on, it smashed into an oil compound and a truck loaded with drums of fuel. The Lord Burley, which was carrying 1,000 gallons of fuel itself, slithered on for another 70 meters until coming to a standstill and I started to crawl slightly upwards towards a piece of light. I looked out through the hole and I saw Bert Wally. I was practically naked. The, ex the explosion or whatever you can call it had taken off my, my shoes and uh, my, my clothes and uh, there was only belt left with some sort of uh, um, parts of my trousers. And in the distance I saw the radio operator, a fellow called Rogers, Peter Howard, Ted Alliard, and the two Stuart S's. And they were running through the snow and they shouted, run, run, run. 
And I got out quickly. I got out down the side, around the side. It was, there wasn't anything on the right. So I got out there. And uh, I made a, a 20 hour. I never run so fast in my life when I went down there. I stood there. And just with that, the captain of the plane came around the side of the plane, a very, and I repeat, a very brave man. He had a tiny little fire extinguisher, which you would see in the car today. And he shouted to me, run your ship at bastard, it's going to explode. I think I was the only one who was in that position to be able to stop and look and see the whole picture. Oof. And I heard <coughs> a baby crying. And I shouted to the people, come back, there's people alive in here. Harry Gregg uh, had appeared and was stood there with his arms out sh shouting, come on lads, come on lads, where are you all, where are you all? And I found the baby and I come out and I ran afterwards and the man Rogers was shouting, he came back to meet me. I gave him the baby and I found the mother, the mother found me and she was in a very, very bad way. And when I say I kicked her, kicked her in the middle of the back, out through the aircraft. I saw uh, uh, Harry Gregg coming out of this inferno, practically, a very brave man, came out carrying this baby in his arms and handed it over to Vera Lukic. The crew and survivors would now battle together to help those that could be saved. I went back round right inside again and I found Albert Scanlon and Ray Wood. I tried to pull them out and they were both trapped. They were dead as far as I was concerned. I came round what was left of the wing on that side of the plane and Bobby Charlton, Bobby Charlton and Dennis File were lying half in, half out of where the six-seater car school would have been. But I was still fastened into my seat and, and when, I, when I woke up, I thought I'd just opened my eyes. I thought I'd just closed my eyes, you know. And then afterwards, Harry, Harry and uh, Bill Folks said that I'd, uh, I'd been about a quarter of an hour, to, you know, quarter of an hour unconscious. And in that time, they'd been going in and, and helping the others, you know. Uh, I could walk towards the, towards the plane. And I saw uh, uh, on the ground uh, the unfortunate uh, Tommy Cable who swaps seats with me. Matt Busby was quite quite near to me and he was sitting in a pool of water and I and I, I, I took my coat off and because he he was obviously seriously injured but I um, but I, I thought well at, le at least he didn't have to sit in a pool of water you know so I, I put, my, put my coat underneath him yeah. It was a furchtbarer Schreck that man irgendwas denkt hat überhaupt nicht kann man nicht Wir, wir war vor einer Ruine gestanden, mir hat, mir hat nichts mehr gesehen. Mir hat die Leute, mir gar nicht gewusst, wo man zuerst helfen sollte. What was left of the aeroplane was a badly damaged cockpit, a small galley, and what we call being clever now, the trailing edge of the wing. There was nothing else left. there to be thanked Harry Gregg and, and Bill Foulkes because uh, I don't know if I would, would have been brave enough to actually do that but it was it, 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 it meant it, in, in a way you, you thought well maybe football's not the beginning there'd be an end all of everything you know One of the pilots Kenneth Raymond was still trapped inside the cockpit and uh, by Captain Raymond uh, Raymond's Befreiung Da war noch ein Mann dabei, das ist auf dem Foto zu sehen, aber wir wissen nicht, wer das war. Das muss ein Amerikaner gewesen sein. Mhm. Und äh, mehr auf, der, auf dem Cockpit war kein Platz. Also mehr konnten wir konnten gar nicht helfen. Da. Und das, ich habe halt versucht, das Bestmögliche, um de, den Captain frei zu bekommen, damit er rauskommt. Das hat natürlich eine Zeit gedauert. Dann. Das, das ging nicht so schnell. Although they managed to get him out in one piece, um, he really was badly injured. And, uh, and lapsed into a coma that night, you know, never to recover. The dead and survivors were gradually being taken from the scene to the wrecked Deir Issa hospital. A man turned up in a, 
a van, an old van with a side door. And we started to put people in, ordinary people put people in. Strange enough, a German was sitting opposite of us in this, uh, in this uh, lorry. And uh, on the journey to the hospital, he looked at us and laughed. Uh, was it a nervous reaction on his part? I believe it must have been. But Bobby was upset and he wanted to find this man. He said, why are you laughing? What is so funny? We headed through the snow and through the streets and Bill kept punching the head, and I mean physically punching the head of the driver because of the skidding. And he was petrified. He kept reaching over Dennis and punching the driver and telling him to stop. In the fairness of the driver, the driver kept going. I went back to the hospital, saw him having a look at people and see who survived. And I uh, was surprised there weren't as many survived as I thought. The hospital, headed by Professor Maurer, implemented their emergency plan. Teams of doctors, nurses, surgeons, specialists, and even medical students were drafted in to help. The expertise of Maurer and all his staff would save many lives. They then took Bobby Charlton, Bill Folks, and myself. Some nuns took us away from where we were. I started to cry when I heard over the uh, tannoy, Frank Swift. All I heard was Swift. Kaput. We, we were in a waiting room. I remember it. I remember it clearly. And uh, I think I had, had concussion or you know, something. I had, had a few little cuts on my head and, and what have you. But I started ranting. I started ranting and raving at this poor, this poor lad. And... Uh, and then they came up to me and they, they, they gave me an injection in my neck and, uh, and I didn't remember anything till the following morning. Although I was in war and, and, ex, and, and was wounded in, a, in, in, in war and saw a lot of, but this was, this surpassed in, 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 in horror, anything that I experienced in my, in my partisan life. Back home, the terrible news began to break. Suddenly, you just got the sense, word went round the office that something major was happening, it was a big story. There was a knock on the door, he was a um, local journalist for the lo for local newspaper and he, he um, just said, uh, we've heard on our um, cable that there's a, a, been an accident. My mother came running out the house and called me in, shouted, shouted at me to come in. I thought, What's, you know, what have I done wrong? I heard this man shouting, plane crash, plane crash. And I said to my wife, what's he shouting plane crash for? She says, oh, it's been, probably been an aeroplane crash. She said, there's an airport outside, the, you know. So the editor, because the evening paper was coming to a close then, said, right, I want, I want the office cleared, except for, and he named a few people, senior people, to bring out a special edition during the, day, during the evening. By this time, people were gathering outside the, the office on uh, Cross Street, waiting for news. I think my mother actually found out on a sandwich board outside the shop and headlines and went, rushed home and... Yes, my reaction was a scream. I, I can hear it now when the news came over the phone. And, and, that really, that, and then that's all I can remember of that particular day. It was horrendous. I got a phone call and I went in and it was Jimmy Murphy. And he says, Christy, I said, yes. He said, um, we've bad news, he says. You heard, you know what, I said yes. He said, we bad news. He said, Liam didn't survive it. He says, from what's left here, 
In Old Trafford, he says, we send our sympathies. And my dad's name didn't come up as being alive until about half past ten at night. So she was there from four o'clock not knowing. I mean, I was, they still hadn't struck me. The enormity of it still hadn't struck me. And it was, for her, it was awful. That evening, um, my mother put me to bed. And during the evening, um, she had a visitor, a lady who said she was from British European Airways with news of my father and that my father had been killed in the crash and that actually he deserved to die because he'd been partly responsible for all of the player's death. As it turned out that wasn't true but that was the news that my mother had that evening. Late that night we were made to go to bed to lie down so we lay down and my mother said when she had gone up the police had come to give us official notice that he was dead. So I was up and I was lying on the bed and she said, Christy, I said, yes. She said, if, if he was dead, she said, shouldn't the police come to notify us? And I said, they were here, ma'am. A policeman came and he was obviously a very um, I don't know what his name was. I can't, couldn't remember. I never heard his. I never remembered his name, but he was obviously a very um, high-ranking police officer because he had a load of gold braid on his shoulder, and he just came and said that David had David had died in the crash, and uh, what did we want doing with his body? We were just devastated. The city of Manchester was in mourning. A nation was bereaved. I was just so bloody sad to think that within the next few weeks or even months, you couldn't see half of them again. It was so sad. I got on the bus, went home, straight to St. Patrick's, and I must have sat in there for about an hour. And just cried and cried and cried, you know, because they were my idols. It was a, a nightmare, and uh, the shock of, uh, of it all, you felt as though you were in a fog. It was one of the worst moments of my life. It's like when my dear old mother died, you know, it was the same kind of sadness as that, you know, and it, it, was, it was terrible. Had the crash scene, one person remained alive and as yet undiscovered. Nine o'clock in the night, two German reporters went back to the plane to look for something, and I was still in there. They had a phone up for an ambulance to pick me out. They could see my white shirt. I was breathing, and amongst all the burning cases and it, I was, I was still, I was last to come out. The German investigator arrived even later in the evening, six hours after the crash. He quickly drew conclusions about the causes of the disaster. I'm aware that he went to the aircraft and just started walking around. Nothing more than that. There was a little bit of light from arc lights from the cameraman and a little bit of headlight from emergency vehicles, but it didn't appear to be a particularly in-depth investigation. I got the feeling that perhaps he was looking for any ice on the wing that might have supported his idea. But he also wanted to get rid of the wreckage very quickly afterwards. Nein, es war kein Eis drauf. Da hat es ziemliche Probleme gegeben deswegen. Ja. Weil nämlich äh, Flughafen hat ja behauptet, dass die Maschine wäre vereist gewesen. We had a call, the hotel people were great, uh, to say that early hours of the morning that the remainder of the crew had come back. And we went down to their room or quarters and I argued with the pilot. The pilot who remained Captain Thane, and I said, I watched, no, no, I said, I watched the undercarriage come up, which I did. I watched the undercarriage, and I thought, we're up, no problem. And he, he explained flying to me for the first time to a, an Irishman, he explained flying. In the Munich hospital, the survivors were starting to discover the full horror of what had just happened. The following morning, um, there was a young lad in the same room as me, and he, he read, he read, he had a paper and uh, he, he told me all about, you know, this is the accident and what have you. And he didn't speak English really, but he was gesturing. And then, uh, and then I just, 
I, I, I went through my, the list of players in my mind and he just told me yes or no if they were alive or dead. But, uh, which is really, really, um, is a killer really. On the 7th of February, Jimmy Murphy and the families were flown out to Germany. Jimmy asked us twice to go back to the hospital. Uh, Jimmy Murphy asked Bill and myself to get back so that people would see us and not realize how bad it was. And we went, followed Professor Marr around the beds to everybody, including Duncan, Albert, everybody concerned. And he gave to Jimmy his opinion, like 50-50, strong boy. The boss, Matt Pusby, strong man, 50-50. And sadly, Duncan, strong boy, 50-50. Uh, Johnny Berry, his words were, I knew what his words were. I'm not God. I remember vividly on the left was the pilot, as well as dear wife sat with him, unconscious. Across from him was Matt in an oxygen tent. So I went across there, lifted up the flap of, the, of this tent effort, and he just, just turned his head and he said, oh, it's you, Jimmy. And I, he said, keep the flag flying. I used to climb the stairs to get away from everybody and I'm climbing up one, two, three, four, five stories and I got to the corner and I heard this crying and I looked around the corner. I don't even like saying it now. And Jimmy Murphy was sitting there crying his eyes out. The bodies were flown back to Manchester. The city that had cheered on the young heroes now wept as they returned. I have never ever ex experienced anything like it in my life, then or since. There must have been a hundred thousand people, half of them on the knees, pouring down with rain. It was unbelievable. For weeks after, And you know, the supporters, they were all crying. They were truly crying. I couldn't believe it. The coffins came back from the crash, and I, we, we helped to carry them and put them in the old gymnasium at the side. And they were in the gymnasium at the side. And well, we were training sort of 50 yards away from that. You know, it was, it was a very, very strange experience. But I do remember the New Zealand's uh, funeral coming back. In, into Dublin and, and stopping at, at home farm. Uh, I'm there with my father, and my father explaining to me the significance of it. Uh, and I'd never forgot that. And like so many other Irish people, you became instant supporters of, of, of Man United. We lost so many mates. Never forget that. It was a horrible time. Horrible time. On February the 10th, the Lord Mayor of Manchester officially launched a disaster fund which would eventually raise over £50,000 with donations from around the country and even from the inmates of some of the country's prisons. Harry Gregg and Bill Folkes returned to Manchester by ferry and train with Jimmy Murphy. The three of them would play a vital role in the immediate future of the club. The next football fixtures saw a minute silence at grounds around the country. Journalists, too, wore black ties in memory of their colleagues, including former Man City star Frank Swift, Manchester's and the nation's footballing writing establishment had been lost. I think people have to remember that there were as many journalists killed on that plane as there were players. Uh, and sometimes, I'm not saying people forget that, but it, it, it's not obvious to them. And I suppose that puts everything um, into perspective in a way, in terms of um, how the how people are viewed, um, maybe in an import, in, from an importance point of view. Twenty-one people had been killed, with several more critically and seriously injured. One of these, Matt Busby, had doubts over his future in football. I remember my first reaction was never to have anything to do with football again. 
this was my mind and my mind. And my wife, my wife went again, come along <clears throat> one of these days and said, uh, if these boys had to say this, passed on, they would want you to carry on. With Busby convalescing, the club would somehow have to find the strength to carry on. It was left in the hands of a man stricken with grief, but determined to salvage its future. No one realised I went through hell, come back, and had no one to talk to, really. Plenty of people around, but I'm talking at my 11 in soccer. I had to find a team of 11. I was a 15-year-old at the time. I didn't really uh, recognise stress and pressure. But in later years, you, you, you can't understand what the man must have gone through with all these young players dying, going to their funerals, going to Bert's funeral, and having to deal with uh, selecting a team, getting a team, and getting on with a job that he didn't want, really. If you'd offered my father a manager's job, he'd have probably turned you down. Les Olive was the assistant secretary, 28 years of age. He was a young man, and he suddenly thrust in, into dealing with, with the crash, with the aftermath, with the families, with the authorities, we're trying to get a game on with no staff. Ernie Taylor, who was at the end of his career, he came from Blackpool and he smoked like a trooper and he, <laughs> he had a drink as well. But a brilliant man to have around the place, um, talking and patting us on the back and encouraging everybody. No. He, uh, he, a lot of players came, but he was the one who stood in my mind, you know, of uh, somebody who helped tremendously. Along with Taylor, Bishop Auckland loaned three of its amateur England internationals to help bolster the ranks. Jimmy Murphy knew me from my training days down there. And uh, I was down at Old Trafford, strange enough, looking at the, um, the coffins of, in the gymnasium. And Jimmy asked if he could have a word with me and I, um, before I left. So I, said, I went to see him and, in his office and he just said that, uh, would it be possible if I could bring a couple of players and myself to play in the second team and uh, give, give them a little while to recover their composure, as it were. I remember this togetherness really, like everyone, everyone like even <coughs> the boys who weren't playing in the team, everyone wanted them to win. They wanted them to do well, you know, in all aspects of it. So there was no animosity from anyone who wasn't picked to play 